Well, the short answer is there wasn't a book like this. So the first question really is, why isn't originalism, this idea that we should interpret the Constitution according to its original meaning, right? The, the way its words would have been understood by the framers who wrote it and the public that ratified it. That's what this originalism is. Why isn't it taught more in the law schools? I mean, it's kind of surprising, right? We have federal judges uh, who are originalists, Probably more than half the Supreme Court uh, at the moment is originalist, uh, and so much of the public, I think, considers themselves to be originalists, or they understand intuitively that we should care what the framers said and so on, but it's not taught in the law schools. Uh, and there are reasons for that, and we could go into that, but uh, so as a student, as a law student, I had to research this on my own. I had to look into it on my own. I had heard about this originalism thing. It made sense to me, uh, and so I had to strike it out on my own. I didn't find an, an introduction. I looked for one. I couldn't find one. I had to read all of these very interesting books on particular theories of originalism and so on, but there was no one single volume, short narrative introduction uh, to originalism. It's an introduction to and defense of originalism and the founding. So I have done all the work for you in this short book. Uh, so if you want an introduction, there wasn't one before and, and now there is one. So that's why I thought I had to do it. There are different kinds of defenses of originalism, many of which don't talk about the founding. I think that's wrong. I think a complete defense of originalism requires also a defense of the founding. The way the argument of my book works, it's sort of a two-step argument, right? The first question is, look, how do we interpret law in our legal system, right? Ordinarily, we first figure out what does this law actually say? What does it mean? What does it do, right? Whether it's a contract or a statute or a treaty or a constitution. And then there's the question of, okay, well, are we bound by that law? Are we bound to this contract? We're bound even by Congress's bad laws, right? So the question is, we interpret legal texts, I argue, right? The way we interpret any communication intended as a public instruction, right? With its original public meaning, right? Not a secret meaning, right? Not, otherwise it'd be a pretty ineffective instruction. That's how we interpret these documents. But that doesn't answer the question of, well, should we be bound by that document at all? Someone might say, well, okay, fine. I, I get that the original meaning of the Constitution is X, Y, and Z, but we don't care. We don't want to be bound by what a bunch of long since dead white men wrote. So to fully defend originalism, you have to argue that the Constitution is binding law the same way that the laws of Congress are binding such that we should care what it says and we should follow its original meaning. Because the best non-originalist will say we're okay with judges updating the meaning and content of the Constitution over time. And so be it. You know, we, They're even okay distinguishing the Constitution from ordinary laws, right? They just, the Constitution's different. It's old and it's hard to change. That's, that's the premise, right? So to fully defend originalism, I think the originalist has to defend the binding nature of the Constitution, and that requires a defense of the founding. And my claim is the Constitution is binding if it successfully balances self-government and liberty. In a free society like ours, we don't just care about what a majority of the people want. Right? What, why do we have constitutions? Why, what, what does a constitution for a free society have to accomplish? And the answer is two things. It has to cr successfully create a regime of self-government. This is what you were getting at. A regime by which we the people can choose who we want to be and govern ourselves and decide who we want to be politically, morally, socially, culturally, economically, what have you. But at the same time, this exact same document, this exact same piece of paper also has to preserve a large measure of liberty, of natural liberty. Otherwise, why would we get out of the state of nature into this thing called civil society if we got a raw deal, if we gave up too much of that freedom we had in, this, in the state of nature? We would never leave the state of nature. So a free constitution has to balance these two things, self-government and liberty. And I say balance, why? Because these objectives are in tension with each other. Right? It's often popular majorities that infringe on the rights of minorities. So writing a constitution that successfully balances these competing objectives is, is no easy task. And I argue that the framers were remarkably successful at achieving a balance between self-government and liberty, such that the constitution is legitimate and binding today, even if it's imperfect, right? I mean, here's, 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 the, here's the point, right? This is the key takeaway. Something must make a constitution binding. It can't be that no constitution is ever binding. So society would fall apart. That can't be right. 
But it also can't be the case that a constitution is only binding if it says exactly what you personally would want it to say. That's also crazy. 300 million Americans might have a different opinion about that. There must be some middle ground, something that makes a constitution legitimate and therefore binding, even if you think it's imperfect in certain provisions or particulars. My claim is the constitution is legitimate and binding in this sense if it meets this threshold balancing of self-government and liberty, these two objectives of a free society, even if you would do things a bit differently on either side of the equation. Today, we have all of these movements to, well, we need to change the Constitution, right? Why do we care about what a bunch of dead white men said? But the Constitution is insufficiently democratic, they might say, right? This is, here, here, here's what's so crazy and insidious about this. The people who want to change the Constitution, who think the Constitution is bad, some bad document, they say two things. They say it's insufficiently democratic. We need better democracy. We need to get rid of the equal representation in the Senate. We need to get rid of the electoral college, right? It's insufficiently democratic. But at the same time, these same people want to make sure that democratic majorities can't do certain things, right? You can't decide on moral issues like abortion or gay marriage. So we want better democracy, but only if it leads to progressive results. I mean, that's crazy. That's typically uh, the, the approach here. And as I was reading about the founders and their political philosophy, it turns out that when you have these objectives, right? First of all, it, it was itself an incredible achievement to say, we want self-government and we want liberty and it requires a balance, right? Republican remedies for the diseases most incident to Republican government, as Madison says in Federalist 10, simply stating this objective and the understanding that their intention with each other, these two objectives, is itself an innovation and we're indebted to them for that. And then they did a pretty darn good job of striking this balance, a pretty amazing job through ingenious mechanisms that were novel at the time. Separation of powers, checks and balances, the enumeration of power and this division of federal state power. The representative mechanism itself was a novelty at the time. And of course, the provisions in the Bill of Rights uh, were also a, a novelty. But more than that, what's so great about the constitution of our founders is they wrote it in such a way that it would continue to strike a successful balance between self-government and liberty long into the future. On both sides of this equation, right? Look at the liberty side of the equation. The rights protecting provisions of the Constitution are written in sufficiently broad terms to be applicable to changing circumstances. Why do you think the First Amendment applies to the speech made on the internet? Why do you think the Fourth Amendment, unreasonable searches and seizures, right, applies to GPS devices that police officers put on cars, right? Many things the founders couldn't have conceived of. And on the self-government side of the equation, I'll just end on this. What does the Constitution actually insulate from democratic self-government? Very little, right? The, the rights most essential to free societies, like free speech, press, religion, assembly, petition, self-preservation rights, if you will, in the Second Amendment, due process rights. But other than that, for the most part, the Constitution leaves most questions for the democratic process precisely because the founders expected that we would evolve and progress over time. Right? That was its genius. If they didn't expect us to change and to progress and evolve, they would have baked more things into the Constitution. Right? So on both sides of this equation, this liberty and self-government uh, side of this equation, the Constitution of our framers, especially as it's been corrected by the 14th Amendment and the Reconstruction Amendments, uh, are really remarkable achievements. I like to say that the constitution of our founders may be a dead constitution, but the democracy that that constitution creates is a living, breathing democracy. We can evolve, we can progress. The question is who's responsible for that evolution? Is it we the people through the democratic process, except where the constitution insulates those most fundamental rights and liberties? Right? Or is it up to rarefied elite judges who all went to Harvard and Yale to decide? how we should evolve and progress over time. So no one's saying we shouldn't evolve and progress. The Constitution allows for it. The question is, who does the Constitution expect to make these changes? And the answer is we the people, not we the judges. It's only 135 pages. I like to say that the book has at least three virtues. It's short, it's cheap, and it has a really pretty cover. Now, I also happen to think it has the fourth virtue of being correct, but that's uh, more a matter of debate. But yes, I intended this book to be a short introduction to law students, advanced college students, general readers, the general audiences interested in the Constitution, and I think it really is uh, accessible for everybody. I have another book coming out also with 
uh, Cambridge. It's called The Second Founding, An Introduction to the 14th Amendment. The book will have the same three virtues. It'll be short, it'll be cheap, and it'll, I promise you will have a great cover. Uh, and the argument of this book is that these grand provisions, right, of, of the, the 14th Amendment, due process of law, right? The 14th Amendment is, is the amendment that says no state uh, shall deny uh, or deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And it also has this sort of more ambiguous or vague clause, the Privileges or Immunities Clause, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. So that's what the 14th Amendment says. Now someday I'll memorize the whole Constitution, but for now I just have the first section of the 14th Amendment uh, uh, memorized. But So those are the provisions, right? Due process, equal protection, uh, and the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Now today the Privileges or Immunities Clause has been written out of the Constitution. Since the 1870s, the court messed it up, fine. But a lot of constitutional litigation today is done under due process and equal protection, or subs this thing called substantive due process, right? Abortion rights, same-sex marriage, uh, incorporation of the Bill of Rights against the states, it's all done under the 14th Amendment. So my claim in this book, right, is that the 14th Amendment, these so-called glittering generalities, right, due process of law, equal protection of law, privileges or immunities, are not as broad as as we've learned in law school, okay? They are not these open-ended invitations for judges to do whatever we want in the modern day, to import modern day extra textual values. But neither are these overly narrow, rigid terms. We're not bound by what the framers of the 14th Amendment thought about things in 1866 or 1868. My argument in this forthcoming book, again, that's short, okay, is that the 14th Amendment is written in terms of the language of the law, due process of law, equal protection of the laws, the protection of the laws, and the privileges and immunities of citizenship have well-established antebellum legal meanings uh, that are not nearly as broad as, you know, a Justice Anthony Kennedy seems to think or progressives uh, tend to think. And it's not overly narrow, like sometimes Justice Scalia uh, tended to think. They actually chart this happy uh, middle course. So for example, the key argument that I make is that this privileges or immunities clause is an anti-discrimination provision with respect to state-defined civil rights. This means, I think, that Brown v. Board of Education the school desegregation cases from the 19, from 1955 is easy, is easy under the original anti-discrimination reading of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. So the results actually might surprise you. So my claim is that if we were to recover the original meaning of the 14th Amendment in terms of the language of the law, the, it wouldn't be scary. The 14th Amendment wouldn't exclude women. It wouldn't exclude gays. It does nothing of the sort. Uh, uh, these provisions protect all of us. They're, we're not bound by this narrow view uh, of, of what people thought in 1868 or 1866, but it's also not this broad and open-ended vehicle f for judges to do whatever they want, this open-ended vehicle for judicial policymaking. So that's the overarching frame of, of, of the book.